Somewhere in between, Andrew Tate flat out disavowing the red pill, Rolo Tomasi telling high value men to get vasectomies, Fresh and Fit getting demonetized, and Sneeko flat out saying this. And let's be honest, the red pill is, uh, is dying. I think it's fair to say that the red pill, the manosphere, might be over. Hello and welcome back to the Late Onicles. <gasps> It is I, the Leighton in question, and today we are going to be combining my academic background and my background of being terminally online to debunk some of the most prominent presuppositions, some of the most prominent talking points of the red pill. I began doing this during my previous video wherein I reviewed the red pill as a whole, but then during that I also made my own criticisms of it, such as the idea that women live life on easy mode, which... Okay. Women have it on easy mode. You live life on easy mode. Women live life on easy mode. And then also what I observe to be that the red pill doesn't actually teach men to look for love or even believe in it because they're more concerned about playing relationship power games than anything else. I don't think it's a man in a man's best interest to be in love with a woman. So now in this video I'm going to be extending upon those critiques made by talking about some of the impressions that one may get from watching red pill content ideas such as that there's only one kind of viable man you know if you watch red pill content you'll get this very rigid idea of what a man is. There's also the idea that there's only basically one kind of woman and then we're also going to talk about sexual market value we're gonna run it back because i've got more things to say on the topic because it's so fucking silly the, where i peg women as far as their the, their peak sexual market value is right around 22 or 23 years old 23 24 23 okay. 24 right about, right around there of course throughout as usual i'm going to be making references and citations to other academics such as psychologists and evolutionary psychologists and then later on i'm also going to talk about the psychology of a red pillar, you know, a red pill audience, the personality psychology of them. I'm going to assume, because you obviously watched my previous two videos, that you at least have a cursory knowledge of the red pill. If that's not from me, it's from watching it yourself. You know, so ideas like the matrix, how 80% of men aren't viable for dating, the idea that women are hypergamous and how that plays into sexual market value. And then, you know, all the other dating discourse things that you've no doubt come across over the past few years. That is all I have to say in the intro of this video. So let us debunk the red pill's most prominent talking points as the Tower of Babel crumbles before our very eyes together. So the first idea that I want to refute is the idea that there is only one kind of man. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a man relative to oneself? What does it mean to be a man relative to attracting women? In regard to the self part, I'm going to extend upon that when I talk about masculinity, but for now we're going to be talking about what does it mean to be a man relative to attracting women, relative to attracting the ladies. Before I continue though, I should talk about what I mean by one kind of man by which I essentially actually mean one kind of viable man because if you have been within red pill circles manosphere the manosphere scene you have no doubt come across the idea of say Adonis the top G simply being what they constitute as being high value these concepts these names the thing that unites them is the commonality between their ability to attract women so I'll unpack that in a second but first we should start from first principles what is an ideology. An ideology, baby boy, is a lens through which one looks through the world. You observe a phenomenon and then your ideology kind of coats the way in which you perceive it. You do not perceive the world neutrally or objectively. You see it through a subjective lens and that subjective lens is an ideological one. And then what tends to happen with ideologies by their very nature is that you through the process of inductive reasoning, that is to say you start conclusion first and then you find evidence to support it later, you arrive at a predetermined conclusion. X, Y, and Z you come across in a, like a novel manner, but A, B, and C already tells you this is the way that you have to perceive X, Y, and Z. Or Z for you, Americans. Now the issue with ideologies is that they are hard to disprove 
because generally speaking they deal in the realm of hearth truths which is to say that they start with a kernel of truth a seed in the middle let's say and then they extrapolate beyond that to prescribe a cure or solution for the issue the phenomena that they are observing so to give the devil its due let's talk about one of the aspects of truth within the red pill that can be backed up by science by evolutionary psychology which is this idea that we as people compete for mates even things like um how we compete for mates and this is another kind of strange for some people angle on it but mating is inherently a competitive process uh, in that desirable mates are in scarce supply relative to the numbers of people who want them. I think despite the fact that the idea that we're in competition with one another may make you feel uncomfortable, it nevertheless baby boy is true whether it's on looks alone or whether you combine it with personality and of course you know we all have our personal taste and what we find attractive and so on generally speaking we can have this kind of like abstracted idea of who is attractive and who isn't and we also go as far as to in a somewhat dehumanizing manner put them on a rank order scale from one to ten on aggregate here is what my level of desirability is it sounds goofy but again we all have these shortcuts you judge people in a split second blah blah okay men do it to women women do it to men men do it to other men ostensibly even the straight ones which is why they petitioned to get the old peter parker back because they decided that the new one isn't as attractive it's like bro if Spider-Man is your favorite superhero, you're at least bisexual. This proclivity of having a score about what our desirability is, let's say, leads many, many within the manosphere, the red pill space, to refer to this conceptual realm that we all live in as being a sexual, sexual marketplace. marketplace. And although that is a admittedly cringe <laughs> way of describing things, it no doubt is actually fairly apt, fairly appropriate, especially against the new technological backdrop of dating apps. Why would you ever talk to somebody in real life when you can just beep boop beep boop beep boop and then get rejected 100 times over? Sounds like an upgrade. Am I right, baby boy? We literally swipe through people like we're window shopping and the people that the app has designated as being the most attractive are literally behind a paywall. It's like, you will only be able to talk to me if you give me five dollars first. Like, except it's not five dollars, it's actually much worse. What are the economics of dating in the 21st? Okay. Like captors within the prisoner's dilemma, we turn other people that we perceive to be products to be consumed, and in doing so, we also have to productize ourselves. So then, the question becomes, how does a man in the 21st century convey to a woman why they should be picked, why they should be picked out of the crowd, what is their USP, their unique selling point, you know? How does one become, in the top 20% of guys, how does one become a top G? How does one become a Donner? So that you, baby boy, can stave off the loneliness that you will no doubt otherwise be subjected to. The answer, of course, is to fake it, to create a persona by the time that we are the age where we're ready to date we've already been set up we've been set up to be inauthentic not only that we've been set up to play this game of strategy for how to get the person that we want rather than how to accurately advertise the truth of ourselves so that somebody that wants that can actually find it and most of all because of this whole dynamic we're set up to dupe whoever it is that we date from Carl Jung's Collective Works, Volume 7. The persona is a complicated system of relations between the individual consciousness and society. Fittingly enough, a kind of mask, designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others, and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. A persona is a social mask that we where a character if you will a kind of version of us and i think the extent to which we all wear our mask so to speak we all fall differently on the spectrum like many of you watching red pill content <laughs> on the not bad side of things let's say you no doubt more than likely have to wear a persona so to speak whenever you work a public facing job 
probably even a job in general. You need a degree of separation in case somebody throws their fucking chicken sandwich in your face because you forgot to put the lettuce in. But then, on the not-so-great side of things, you have men uh, changing their personalities to fit what they have perceived to be the ideal man to be, and then feeling internally uncomfortable about it because it's inauthentic and fake. One of the problems that a bunch of friends had about 10 or 15 years ago when the game came out first mm -hmm. with Neil Strauss mm -hmm. was they became very disenchanted with who they were personally because mm -hmm. they created a delta between the person that their uh, evening partner was going to go home with and the person mm -hmm. that they really were. Yeah. And that made them feel bad about themselves. They thought, yeah. oh, hang on. So this is how performative I have to be in order to get a girl to go home with me, which then makes them both resent themselves, but even more so resent women because they feel unlovable as who they are, despite yes. the fact that they've never shown who they are to the person that they're talking to. It goes back to Red Pill. It teaches you to be avoidant on purpose, to never find real love. And then, baby boy, worse yet, we have the promotion of psychopathy, which leads back into the dark triad traits that I began talking about when it came to dating apps, so the other ones being narcissism and Machiavellianism. With respect to psychopathy, though, I'm talking about the emotional coldness, the becoming who one needs to be in order to fulfill the goal. So, from the chameleons of dating, psychopathic traits are associated associated with mimicking pro-social personality traits in dating contexts from evolutionary psychological science. Nine, reports of ex-partners of men who were high in psychopathic traits suggest that these men presented themselves at the beginning of the relationship in particular as someone considerate, loving, and gentle, which might have had the effect of increasing their perceived trustworthiness and ultimately desirability as a male. Men higher in psychopathic traits try to successfully fake good by concealing their true personality. Men with high levels of psychopathic traits are like chameleons who assess the dating preferences of women in their environments and match themselves to those preferences. I'm going to teach you something sad about the male race, and I'm really hoping that the majority of men who are conscious and in this audience can shift this pattern. Men have a um, behavioral strategy that is a holdover from the cave days. And it looks like conquest. Conquest is the male shadow, one of them. It's, I'm going to behave in whatever way I need to behave to get exactly what I want out of this woman. It's not really who I am. If I were to hazard a guess, the same reasons pulling somebody toward a psychopathic personality are the same reasons that compel people to play games within relationships, and it is often to create a degree of separation from the potential of emotional pain. If I create a buffer in between you and me, if I can contort the situation, then I'll be in control, and that makes me emotionally safe. I want to unpack that, but that will veer too much into getting psychological territory, which I'm going to be saving for later. So, for now, suffice it to say that uh, chameleoning your way into a woman's heart by using tactics like love bombing, for instance, is not a good method for actually attaining a sustainable long-term commitment. So, what is the antidote to this way of thinking I hear you ask. I'm gonna drip feed it, I'm gonna give half now, and I'll give him, and I'll give half later. But for now, I just wanna open up this section of the antidote by asking you, baby boy, the question of whether the idea that there's only one viable way to be a man, have you found that idea helpful? Because I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna think not. Uh, I think there's almost this kind of like mimetic thought virus thing that's happening that is partially an explanation for why men looking for relationships has gone down because it's almost as if they're disqualifying themselves before even women are given a chance to disqualify them because it's like, well, I don't make six figures and my status isn't that high and I'm not as attractive as... They're essentially taking themselves out the fucking gene pool because some fucking geezers sat around a table said that they're not good enough. These are guys trying to appeal to guys, bro. Which is kind of sus when you think about it. My point is, 
Ideologies are mimetic mind viruses that thrive on making you feel oppressed, making you not feel good enough. They narrow your scope, they heighten your victim complex, so much so that even if the truth, so to speak, the capital T truth was waved in your face over and over again, you wouldn't even be able to see it because you're so predisposed to not seeing it. The inability to accept that there are multiple viable ways of being that can lead to success, to me, only really speaks to a rigidity of thought and actually runs counter to evolutionary psychology that red pill ideology seems so intent on bastardizing you're absolutely right these guys are getting bad advice from all directions and probably the biggest theme in my academic career is trying to remind people that a lot of our mate choice, a lot of our mate preferences are for mental traits and personality traits and, uh, and moral traits. And that the entire evolution of human intelligence and creativity and our capacities for language and, and art and music and humor were products of sexual selection by both sexes. So this, this idea that like women are only attracted to seven foot tall giga chads with 300 pounds of muscle and square jaws is empirically false because if that was true we would already all look like that so now that we're done talking about the tomfoolery about how there's only one kind of viable man we can now talk about how the red pill seems fascinated to try and propagate that there is essentially only one kind of woman. I went over in a previous episode how the red pill ostensibly does this, and it's by carefully curating the samples of women that you are subjected to as a viewer. So as far as you're aware, you have parasocially interacted with, let's say, over hundreds of women that, as far as you can tell, are all basically the same, and I'm telling you that it's because they have been curated in such a manner. They are a part of the Red Pill's controlled opposition. The Red Pill needs eye candy, hate candy, for you to come back and watch for more so you can ogle them, and then the guests don't actually care how well they're representing women because, as I mentioned in a previous video, they're getting a bag regardless. I've never seen a girl get dunked on more than this girl on, on, on Fresh and Fit, ever. Like, they, the whole chat was just on her the en entire time. She got 1,200 paying subs mm -hmm. in 24 hours. That's $12,000 a month. That's $144,000 a year they from sitting you. for sitting there for two and a half hours getting dunked on by the chat. And she, she wrote me later and she was like, yeah, it's totally worth it. I would do it again. So due to the content, the podcast that seek to bridge the gap for young men in particular to give them an idea of what women are like because they lack the actual life experience to make up the conclusions for themselves or and particularly and i think this is at the heart of the red pill quite a lot that is very much under discussed the actual like pipeline through which people come through to the red pill is actually post heartbreak post traumatic encounter within their life. So now the community has gotten so insular that now it's very common to find takes like these online completely uncontested. And unfortunately, all the girls currently that live in the West, let's say 99% of them, they're all hoes. They're all for the streets. They are heartless. If she doesn't have burning desire for you, she's for the streets, King. Or if you weren't so fucking hellbent on interacting with women with this fucking underlying hatred that's fucking seeping out of your sweat glands, maybe, I'm just saying, you'd have a higher probability of a relationship continuing. It's just a theory. That's just a theory. Okay. For context, this geezer that I've just shared with you has over 5 million subscribers, right? The video that I just shared with you is titled A Lesson on Dating That Everyone Should Hear. Bro, I never knew Ugwe was this wise. The fact that he went from making funny skits to helping the homies out, one word, respect, in all caps. As someone who has never touched a female, I can confirm the master's advice is 100% helpful. How the f- the men bandwagoning videos like these have fallen victim to what I call the woman-hating industrial complex. Quick, if you will. I'm going to share with you a definition in a second, one that I found off the back of those videos that are like, 
how much money should your future husband earn? Uh, there was a quote tweet from that. So again, how much money should your future husband earn? And of course, because these people are basically fucking children, so they're saying things that are pretty gosh darn outlandish, or we as the viewer are supposed to think so anyway. So they're saying things like 300k, half a million, 650,000, which is oddly precise if you ask me. And then of course they reveal that the median income for Americans is 45k, to which they're all like, whoa, so it's essentially, whoa, look how overinflated women's expectations are. It's what I call red pill bait. Curated red pill bait are the people that say, you know, I don't actually care about how much money he makes, or are the people that say 45k is okay, are the people that say 30k is even fine because money is not the biggest deal to me. Anyway, are those going to be included in the video? Of course not, because this is a curated video for a curated ideology. You are a horse with blinders on at the side. You cannot see what is to your periphery. They are making it so. There is a whole online industry growing that is creating content to make men feel like shit about their ability to be loved, to be in relationships. When you see a video like this, you need to remember that the desired outcome is you resenting women and feeling insecure. Talk to them. So I spoke about this in my section in the previous video talking about this idea that women live life on easy mode. I think young men in particular, but also men in general, have a fairly warped idea of what it means to be a woman, how it feels to be a woman. And since then, I've only really come across more examples to support that suspicion that men really don't fucking understand, particularly young men, <clears throat> don't understand women at all. I came across an episode of Fresh and Fit wherein Destiny and Sneeko appeared. Uh, Destiny being a centre-left uh, commentator, political commentator, streamer, etc. And then Sneeko, who once upon a time made these introspective, somewhat cinematic videos, and now is more recently known for... WAKE UP! COME BACK TO REALITY! GET OFF OF TIKTOK! GET OFF OF INSTAGRAM! YOU'RE SO STUPID! So, Destiny asks the table, what percentage of women do you think are being flown out to, you know, these exotic places like Dubai and Miami and here and there? And the answer is pretty gosh darn telling from guys that supposedly know women inside out and say things like, let me translate that for you from womanese, womanese. as though women speak this completely foreign fucking language. Bro, you're fucking stupid. Okay. I just want to hear for, for the record, yeah. for you three to answer this, uh -oh. what percentage of college women do you think are being flown around the world to fuck? Very I want to hear from all if three I to argue, I want to hear. Off of like probability wise, if I argue, maybe like, 30, 40, 50? 30, 40 percent? Is that what you said? Well, globally speaking, but I'm just saying, like, for example... <laughs> that, you understand that's a, the, the actual number is, like, less than 0.1 percent, right? Of girls getting flown out? Of girls yeah. getting flown out to fuck guys from college, normal very girls. Little. Very little. It's very, very little. Very, very <laughs> I'm from Vegas, and now I'm like, I've never done that. Have you, have you ever been flown out? <laughs> no, 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 no. You've no, never no, done no, no. No. My guy's perception is so off that he really thought that, like, 50 percent of young women at some point in their lives are being flown out by a fucking Saudi prince. Like, bro. Now... In contrast to this, you may have realized that over the past few, I guess, years at this point, there seems to be a new uh, TikTok girly that makes a video and then that permeates out, usually into Twitter for the demons, uh, to devour it and it becomes discourse for a day to a week. So, despite the fact that the Red Pill brands all women as essentially being the same, hose, if you will, and I'm not talking about the gardening equipment. Here is an outlier that's not actually really that much of an outlier that a few months ago, everybody and their grandma and favorite conservative commentator had an opinion on. Here we go. I'm actually starting to get so scared. Like, it's not even funny anymore. How am I 23 and I still have not had my first kiss? Like, like, it's so horrifying. When I was like 22, 21, I was like, haha, it's kind of cute, kind of quirky. Like, not really, but kind of. Like, I could play it off. Now it's getting scary. Like, I don't see it changing anytime soon. And like, I just keep getting older. Now it's gonna be so weird because I'm gonna be so old and I'm gonna have to tell somebody like, yeah, I've never done this before. Like, what? All women aren't for the streets. And there are even some that haven't even had their first kiss, homina, 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 eyes popping out. Like, forget, like, 
being for the streets, Shorty is not even on the fucking cul-de-sac. You know what I mean? And on top of that, that what to many Red Pill viewers may see as an anomaly, there are other anomalies of women that again, you're just not subjected to. First of all, because you don't seek them out, and also because, again, the horse blinders. But, like, there are women out there that don't even like the idea of high-value men, which is no surprise because the idea of high-value is created by guys for guys. You guys are mad sus, bro. I actually think pursuing high-value men is overrated. You should not base your standards off of what the Red Pill Manosphere Collective call high value. The shorties don't all want a high value guy. And despite the fact that this, for many of you, should actually be optimistic, white pilling, if you will, I'm so certain that for some of you, you're actually pissed off that I am revealing, showing you this information, these differences of perspectives, because it shifts the locus of control. Because before this, you could almost argue that there was almost like a nobility in the, the pessimism, in the nihilism, because, well, I would try with women, but they're basically all the same. But now, as I've said, the locus of control has shifted. And the only way that you can ignore the information that I have shared with you just now is if you practice the most rigid cognitive dissonance, the most rigid confirmation bias I have ever seen. Confirmation bias obviously being, you know... I will take the information that already appeals to the way that I view the world and myself and I will discard the things that run counter to it. So here's an example of that happening for you. A pattern I have observed running polls and surveys here. A thousand women say they feel X. Dozens of women in the comments describe feeling X. A man who has never been emotionally close with a woman in his entire life. Actually, women don't really feel X. If you have close female friends or girlfriends slash wives, they will tell you things candidly. You can kind of get an idea of how women really think from this. But if you have extremely limited experiences with women, perhaps you should be less confident in what the inner world of a woman looks like. Kind of like a Dunning-Kruger effect going on. Guys have become so inundated with this idea of what women think through these fucking red pill videos by the same men and the same subsection of women over and over again that when they come across information that doesn't align with their current worldview, they literally discard it and say almost as if the people that are saying anything contrary, that they're lying, that actually no, because I know the truth. It's like, mate, you haven't left your bedroom in three fucking days. How are you going to be so in support of breaking free of the matrix when you're clearly so in a matrix bro the copium is real i should by contrast however say that i'm not saying this stuff to be demoralizing to be mean to you baby boy because there's still a decent chance that you are slash could become a good a dude. Because this proclivity to brand women in an unsubstantiated way is actually quite common and even happens to the good guys of us all like Jay Shetty for instance who for those of you that don't know is a podcaster, communicator, coach type person that talks about relationships and things. He is nowhere near the red pill sphere so to speak and yet had still found himself somewhat befallen to the same kinds of delusions until he had the revelation that all women aren't the same slash don't all like the same things after he found out for himself when i first <laughs> met her and when you see her you're like oh she's an elegant oh yeah you know, elegant me. graceful young woman and and i was just like and i was just like okay so maybe she likes like like oh, grand yeah. gestures and elegant posh places like that's what i thought and this just shows us how a the media makes us assume what people like or we based on how someone appears we assume what they like and so that's what i did i got it completely wrong and so we were both sitting in this restaurant <laughs> and i was really hungry at the end of it and i said to him at the end i was like look even if you just take me on a walk in a really good supermarket or what do they call it here grocery store yes, yeah. grocery store supermarket i was like that is like the most epic date you could take me on get me a few treats from like the <laughs> from the shelves we'll go down the gluten-free vegan aisle that would be the best day and so after that I think you kind of started understanding. I think I still got it wrong a yeah, few yeah, times. Yeah, a few times. I, I, I did the same thing with her. I was always like, but she wasn't impressed by any of the ways I tried to love her right. apart from being me. And that was when it all kind of like uh, unraveled. And I was like, 
oh, I finally found someone who actually didn't want all the stuff I was trying to do to get her to love me. And then you're all of a sudden, like you say, it's like being stripped bare. Yeah. Now I get a chance to truly be loved for for who I am. Yeah. Not the the performance that I'm doing in the beginning. Whilst still on the topic of women, I want to readdress the very commonly thrown around idea within red pill manosphere circles the idea that women are what men must become one of the things we always talk about in sort of the manosphere or the red pill communities is that men must become and women just are and for those of you that are unfamiliar with what that means it essentially stems from the core idea that women are born with inherent value whereas men have to build their value they're playing in two different realms for what constitutes their attraction let's say which i think vaguely has a tinge of merit within it and i spoke about that in the previous video but by and large i think it's more of a poisonous idea than not and part of what bleeds into this idea is this almost like video gamification this perception that men have to become good looking have to have high status and have to have a lot of money in order to become even vaguely attractive whereas women can just exist and as long as they're hot they're fine and i think the red pill exacerbates this upset that men have you know this idea of like i have to do x y and z and they don't have to do anything and they're just hot because you'll be inundated with these videos where like women are like oh yeah i'm a 10 i'm a 10 i'm a 10 i'd say um i'm a 10 as well same with everybody here on this panel <laughs> Yeah, definitely a 10. And then I suspect you have guys on the other side of the monitor that are so frustrated that like, I have to do all these things and I'm not even considered attractive still, you know? I think there's almost like a resentment and upset at these women for ostensibly being confident with zero effort. And then to that, I want to say that women aren't as confident as they're being presented to be in these Red Hill videos and also it's not zero effort. And so to introduce this idea to you, baby boy, I wanna share that just like you, I too be scrolling the internet and I came across a video that you might find illuminating, wherein this public speaker invites members of the audience to partake in an exercise that will hopefully aid them in psychological transformation. That, for those of you that are in the manosphere and constantly inundated with these ideas of women, here is an interaction that may very well be so novel to you that it takes you out of Plato's cave and you see the sun for the very first time. Say right now, this were to go perfectly according to plan, and we were to fast forward till the end. What would you have realized or learned? It's the end. Great job. What did you realize or learn? <clears throat> that I'm not, not as boring as I think I am, that I can trust that what I think will come out in speech, because that's uh, annoying when you think I am I am not stupid, but it sounds like it a lot of time. So, hmm. yeah. Have people said that you're boring or stupid in your life? Probably. Because that was interesting. Good data. You just mm -hmm. brought up once more the boring topic, but then you added on stupid. I don't sound stupid. Well, no one thought you did, but why do you think you might? Where did that come from? Who said you were stupid? When do you start believing you were stupid? Because a part of you definitely does. Where did that come from? Because I've had been very in inhibited mm -hmm. and feeling like walking into a room and feeling unwanted. Mm. And uh, like I have to, I have to be very quiet in, so people don't notice me and then perhaps they will allow me to stay in the room. The question would be, why are you unwanted? I'm not saying you are, but see if a part of you shoots up an answer. Why are you unwanted? Why are you not good enough? Why are you not like everyone else? What's different about you? I'm defect. Mm -hmm. How so? Clearly not functioning on all levels. Mm -hmm. What else? Why are you different? Why is there something broken in you? What comes up? Yeah, 
available. Otherwise, people, people would have loved me more or at all. Mm -hmm. When did you stop loving yourself? I'm not, I'm not sure I started. Okay. We all have self-esteem issues. We all have bouts of imposter syndrome. We all have trauma. So this idea that all women are the same and that these just infinitely confident, undeservingly so creatures uh, is a carefully curated lie. Are there categorical differences between men and women? Yes. Can that still mean that we are more alike than we are unalike? Yes. Which is why, unbeknownst to many men, the red-pilled ones in particular, most women do not think that they are an art piece that should be set under glass as this bastion of perfection. Because actually, women have their own issues, their own goals, their own aspirations. If the algorithms that be didn't admire you in the same repetitive manosphere content over and over again, you would know, baby boy, that women both make and consume self-improvement content. And the reason that I know that is because I watch it. <laughs> That's right, lady content creators. You know that 5% male audience that it says you have? That's me. I'm trying to get tips from everywhere. Why would you listen to a woman on anything? And so if women really thought that they were perfect, there would be no utility in them creating or consuming self-improvement content because what would there be to improve in the first place just think about it fucking logically bro come on bro i'm rooting for you i'm really am but the information's right there bro i really i'm so certain that there's a kind of guy that has already like processed this information that i've shared as being like the only reason a woman would try to improve herself is to increase her sexual market value because that's so much of what like red pill focuses on like their own sexual prospects and so i want to share a quote with you from the book how to win friends and influence people which i have a copy of i just don't have it on the table and i'm not getting up at this point bro i'm locked in and so are you but it's from page 18 of how to win friends and influence people the book that fucking psychopaths read and try and learn how to be a fucking human being <laughs> What? I've never heard of this concept called empathy. I'm learning so much about it. I'm kidding, but also not really. And the reason that I'm citing this book is because it's one of the many books that are shared around the manosphere. So I'm basically being like, here's information from your sources. No ketchup. Okay. And so the quote goes from page 18. Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives, the sex urge and the desire to be great. I want to pair that quote with the idea that I shared in a previous video from David Buss, the evolutionary psychologist, the idea of uh, sexual conditioning, this idea that because for men, sex is more scarce a resource to attain than it is for women, that men become conditioned, that men are sensitive to the kinds of things that will lead them to higher probabilities of attaining sex. And so back to the Freud quote, this idea that say some people do things fundamentally as a way to try and um, increase the probability of them getting sex as opposed to merely for the hell of the game for the love of it, let's say. I think men more than women, if you were to put it on a bell curve, are more led by their sex urge. It's a bigger motivator for them, let's say, again, because of the sexual conditioning thing. You know, sex is more of a scarce resource, and so they have to be more uh, sensitive toward what would potentially lead to sex, even inadvertently, you know? It's almost as if there's this kind of like reptilian ticker in the back of our brains that are like, but if I do this, how much more or less fuckable will I be? And this is why every guy's first thought when they pick up a guitar is, I wonder if I'll be able to play my favorite song. And then their second thought is, I wonder if this will help me get bitches. <laughs> Every accomplishment by men in human history was to impress women. I'm sure Thomas Edison invented the light bulb and they were like, Edison, this is going to change the world. And he was thinking like, and wait till these hoes see it. And so I cut this picture out of a larger picture and it's Venus manifesting herself in a transcendent space in the sky. And she has rays coming off her. And there's all these men who are knights kneeling in front of the image. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that men use the image of female perfection to motivate themselves. And that's exactly right. That's precisely what they do. You see that in the Tom Sawyer story. So Tom Sawyer is about 12 years old, and he's still hanging around with his friends like Huck Finn. And this girl moves across the street, Becky, and she comes out, and he's struck by her for the first time in his life. Something's changed. 
And the first thing he does is hop up on a picket fence and show off and balance in front of her. And he's saying, well, look at me, look at me. I'm, he's like the male bowerbird building something beautiful so the female will approve of it. And it's, it's motivation, at least to the degree that males are uncorrupted and, and not bitter because of being rejected. They're doing everything they can to kneel before the eternal image of the feminine and try to make themselves worthy. I remember first contemplating this idea of this kind of like reptilian brain ticker of like how fuckable am I etc. I was listening to a podcast with uh, Mark Manson on the guy, you know, the, what is his book? The, the fuck one. Oh, there we go. The art of not giving a fuck. There we go. <laughs> and I remember him mentioning on this podcast that essentially, until he either met or married his wife, he also had that kind of like reptilian ticker in the back of his mind, this kind of like hyper-awareness of like, how fuckable am I, how fuckable am I? I don't know to what extent men think about this relative to other men or how much women think about it relative to men. How much of what men do is actually with the kind of superordinate goal of increasing their probability of sex and their desirability as a partner, as a short-term thing, you know? Hamza, for instance, will flat out tell you that the reason that he exercises is to attract women. I wanted to build muscle in the exact places that would make me more attractive, specifically in terms of dating more girls. Muscle mommy, on the other hand, will do it for the purity, just for the love of the game, you know? I, conversely, will learn to play Deftones on a guitar to get a Deftones girlfriend Whereas the pool kids guitarist will play guitar better than me, sing at the same time, and do it just for the love of the game. Now, let us talk about SMV. What the red pill, what the manosphere aspergically calls sexual market value. For men, this is comprised of LMS, lux, money, status. And for women, this is comprised of L, which is to say lux and nothing else. The red pill says that a woman's sexual market value, which by the way, is the only value that they spend time talking about. They don't talk about a woman's value in any other way generally other than her sexual market value, which by the way, they claim to peak at a mere 23 years old. And I obviously debunked this in the previous video, so I'm not gonna go over this now, the ways in which that sexual market value is a dumb concept idea in the way that it's characterized for women. And so I wanna spend some of this video talking about the ways in which sexual market value, conversely, is dumb for men. And so let us begin with the fickleness of the role that status plays in attracting a woman. So the red pill logic in regard to men's sexual market value is that men should delay being in relationships with women they should essentially build an empire by themselves and then by the point that they reach around 35, they will be at peak sexual market value. And then they will be able to use their sexual market value as leverage to be able to attract the most attractive woman that they can get, essentially. This is like men being in their peak ostensibly and then using that as i say as leverage it's the most like anime dragon ball z way of thinking about life you know it's like give me a second whilst i charge up my sexual market value like don't consider monogamy until you're 30 by the time you get to be 34 35 36 years old maybe a little later who knows you maximize your potential you will be at the peak of your sexual market value don't get married. It's such a video gamification of navigating life, you know? So there's this idea within certain kinds of video games of min-maxing, which is to say that you maximize your characters, your team's strength, let's say, whilst minimizing the weaknesses. It's usually this philosophy of like, let's increase the stat as high as it can possibly go. It worked in Fire Emblem, so I'm sure it'll apply to real life just as well. But this video gamified way of seeing the world and seeing relationships and seeing social dynamics in general only really works under the presumption that this is what women are doing also, which baby boy, I'm gonna tell you, they're probably not. They're probably not looking at their sexual market value and getting to the point of 23 years old and then being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna settle down with somebody that's a fucking decade older than me. A healthy, emotionally stable 22 year old is not usually physically attracted to a 45 year old or even a 40 year old. A 22 year old tends to see a 35 year old as an old man. I'm 23. Even when like older guys hit on me, when like a 30 year old hits on me, I'm like, what are you doing? I'm young. 
Why are you hitting on me, psycho? So, as demonstrated, that plan is not a good one in and of itself, in general. It is ineffective. The conclusion, that which you think you are going to reach, my guy, you are not going to reach. However, not only is that not a good plan in general, you know, to build an empire all the way through your 20s up until you're like mid 30s and then to try and look for a woman once your sexual market value has hit its peak. Not only is that not a great idea, because it won't work. On top of that, however, it's also maladaptive for you socially and psychologically, and it's for these reasons that I'm about to recite to you right now, baby boy. So, from sage romantic relationships from adolescence to established adulthood, on the one hand, we found continuity between the romantic pattern experience between ages 16 to 24 and romantic involvement and turnover between 25 to 30. Those who were in a pattern characterized by a low romantic involvement, later and sporadic involvement patterns, continued to show a lower level of involvement in later emerging adulthood. This is to say that if you start later in the process of trying to find your person to spend life with, let's say, you generally speaking will have a harder time of it. You will be at a disadvantage because it's essentially saying the earlier you start, the earlier you'll find your person. And so if you're delaying it all the way back here, by the point that you get to your mid thirties and so on, a lot of the people that you may have liked to pair off with have already been paired off with. And just because, well, now I'm six figures so I can get, no, you can't. That's not how love and relationships work. I'm telling you, stop playing, stop planning on playing these fucking Machiavellian uh, power games. Now, there is a book by Haruki Murakami called Men Without Women. I have not read this book because, first of all, why would I ever read fiction when I live in reality? I can, however, despite not reading that book, tell you what actually happens to men without women. It's the same as what happens to people when they're not with other people in general, and it's essentially that they get mad depressed, my guy. Because as the research shows, the research that I'm about to share with you in just a second, overwhelmingly, the thing by and large, the thing that brings happiness, that brings joy, that brings fulfillment to our lives, more than anything else, is relationships. So, from the Harvard Gazette, an article titled Harvard Study Almost 80 Years Old has proved that embracing community helps us live longer and be happier. After following the surviving Crimson Men for nearly 80 years as part of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, one of the world's longest studies of adult life, researchers have collected a cornucopia of data on their physical and mental health. The surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health, said Robert Waldinger, director of the study, a psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationships is a form of self-care too. That, I think, is the revelation. Close relationships, more than money or fame, are what keep people happy throughout their lives, the study revealed. Those ties protect people from life's discontents, help to delay mental and physical decline, and are better predictors of long and happy lives than social class, IQ, or even genes. I'm not saying that you should live your life like a video game. However, in the event that you were going to live your life like a video game, it's such a no-brainer to not do this Sigma male grind set and just be uh, alone to max out your SMV stat, which is fucking stupid, as we'll get to in just a second. In general, also, interestingly enough, Despite the red pill supposedly being, you know, counter to the libs, you know, the radical left, let's say, counter to the machine, the matrix, and so on. The libs and the social justice warriors and the woke motherfuckers. If it were actually set in traditional values, it would be advocating for marriage and commitment in a way that it certainly isn't doing now. And here is young conservative commentator Ben Shapiro making my point. The meta point being, if Ben Shapiro is saying, get married young, and the red pill that posits itself as being conservative is saying, wait until you're older, then maybe the red pill isn't actually conservative traditionalist in the way that it tries to posit itself to be. Waiting until you're 35 and have slept with 50 women? That is a terrible recipe for marriage by every available data point. It turns out that you are much better in terms of getting married if you get married 
younger, if you do not have a wide variety of sexual partners, this notion that you wait until you're 35, you've already made a bevy of mistakes that have shaped your character and made you much more rigid as a person, and that you should have had a basis of comparison in terms of sex of dozens and dozens and dozens of women. No, the data do not support this and it's stupid. So now that we've covered the status part of sexual market value, we can now talk about the money part of sexual market value with specific reference once again to the red pills fixation on this idea of hypergamy. Hypergamy essentially being the idea that women are more attracted to men that are either equal to them or above them in status, let's say. And so, so that we're starting from a basis of women care about money and that's been documented and so on, I'll share with you a quote that I've shared previously, but you know, we, it's just to get us up to speed, baby boy. So once again, here is an excerpt from Personality Psychology, Domains of Knowledge About Human Nature, 7th edition, Worldwide, women rank a potential's good financial prospects to be more important than do their male counterparts. Perhaps even more important, the personality characteristics that contribute to financial success. Ambition, industriousness, dependability are also highly valued by women worldwide. Whereas men prioritize physical attractiveness, women prioritize social status as a necessity in selecting long-term mates. Once again, as I'll reiterate, I think what's interesting within that is that Evidently, guys do prioritize looks as being their bigger, let's say, like, slice of the pie for what they look Four. like in a potential partner. They prioritize looks. Women, ostensibly, or the parallel that's being drawn within excerpts like these, at least, is that men prioritize looks, whereas women prioritize finances and resources. I've seen, like, Manosphere red pill dudes get kind of tight about this, this idea that, like, why would women care about finances or, you know, other character traits that are, like, I don't know, industriousness and conscientiousness and dependability and things of that nature. Ambition is a woman's womanese for translation for, I providing. want you to be able to provide for me yeah, in the future. Money. Yeah. Okay. Come on, man. In reference to the excerpt that I just read you, you know, the contrast being women care more about finances, whereas men care more more about looks. I think men have a better, potentially easier time with retaining their societal value because it's much more in our hands, you know? Looks are gonna fade regardless. You can retain them, you can do everything that you can. But I've always just found that aspect of like red pill ideology where they get like, we have to do so much. And it's like, or it's not that you need to do so much, it's that you get to do so much because you get to more so be the captain of your own ship. The destiny is in your own hands, I think. Time is not going to suck your value away unwaveringly, regardless of what you do. I'm going to digress. I want to raise the point to you, baby boy, that just because women care more about finances than men do from their partner, that's not to say that women then think that to them finances are the most important aspect of their partner of their relationship. This to me seems to be an issue of statistical competency, which, you know, generally speaking, <laughs> the education system really isn't doing a great job of things. And so here's a parallel to convey to you what I'm getting at. Let's imagine you are presented with the option of two flavors of ice cream. One is strawberry, and one is mint chalk chip. You are then asked by somebody, what is your preference one way or the other? And let's say the way that we can measure how much we want a thing is on a scale of like zero to a hundred. Let's say, again, your pitch, strawberry or mint chalk chip. I personally could say, I'm pretty indifferent. I'll say I'm two metrics out of a hundred of care one way or the other. But then let's say the person that you're with that's also being presented with this question says they're about 20 metrics out of 100 of care, which is still relatively low, but then you can make the parallel say that like, well, one person cares two metrics out of, the other one cares 20 metrics out of. So then you can make the point that the other one cares 10 times more than the other person. It's a 1000% increase. And it's like, no, they're still relatively low. I think that's essentially what's happening with the, the women finances question. I don't think generally speaking, women care superlatively that finances and money be the most important thing. I think they think it's more important than men do in regard to what they look for in their partner, but I still don't think that's like top of their totem pole. They just care about it more relatively, but that's not to say that they care about it more at the top of their qualities. Now, but like some of you will get that, like some of you will understand that, yeah, and other ones it will like go over your head and that, because I'm talking about like relativity and that. I really think that the red pill, the manosphere, goes way overboard in demonizing women for caring about money. And by the way, I'm not talking about women that like, uh, hyper-materialistic, but just women in general. I do think that uh, men 
by and large, particularly the red-pilled ones, can be way more sympathetic towards women than they are. And they don't even have to go into <laughs> feminine energy to do so they can retain their masculine logical brain and still come to a conclusion of like maybe we shouldn't be fucking thrashing women for caring about finances when it comes to life you know given that money is very much central to all of our lives you know so even staying within a logical masculine frame and like using evolutionary psychology here are some evolutionary psychology reasons as to why it makes logical sense for women to care about money so first of all women bear the burden and gift of pregnancy let's say there is a long gestation period and babies literally don't even realize that they're a separate entity to their mom until like half a year into being born into the world you know so that thing like mother and child have to be pretty fucking closely knit together is my point the mom literally becomes the food source for the baby and when women give birth, they experience an earnings gap that they basically never recover from. So I don't think it's that wild for the man of the relationship to hold it down when such a thing happens. If there's a dip here, you would probably want an increase here to balance it out, given that there's so much sacrifice to having a child. Maybe the man them, yeah, can hold it down for a bit and that. You get me? Okay. <laughs> Conversely, what you can do is throw out all of the nuanced reasons that I have given you as to why it makes sense for women to be thoughtful about money and financial prospects of a partner so you can stick to the same banging of the drum of the same trite red pill speaking points on hypergamy that sound like this. You guys need to put women's feet to the fire and make them work for you because you have to bring way more to the table than they fucking do. Yep. Last time I checked, hypergamy is a thing. And what does that mean? They date up, okay? Since they date up, that means that you're dating down. And since you're dating down, that bitch better start, start sucking some dick, fucking making you food, all this extra shit. Two decades ago or something like that, I think Dave Chappelle had a bar talking about how chivalry was dead and women killed it. And if that's true, Maybe at some point men revived it and shot it in the fucking head once more because like, god damn, who raised y'all niggas, bro? You do not need to be earning six figures a year and driving a Bugatti in order to be considered viable as a potential mate. Often what is more important than how much you earn is what you do that earns you income. And I mentioned this in my video about dating apps and incels and fuckboys, backed up by the data scientist Steph Stevens Davidowitz fucking nailed it, about how to women a firefighter earning 50k is actually more attractive than somebody that works in hospitality that earns 200k. The shorties are not playing Machiavellian power games, they're literally just trying to assess whether you've developed into a vaguely competent dude bro. Whether you don't spend fucking eight hours a day playing Call of Duty, bro. As you say, cultivate some skills that are actually going to be attractive and impressive, both to women and also to other men and to employers and to your own relatives, to everybody. Typically, being really, really good at Call of Duty is not honestly that impressive to girlfriends. You could take like a tenth of the hours that you devote to video games and learn how to sing or how to draw or how to do like uh build shit with your hands do you remember passport bro from a few months ago the guy that took it upon himself to look after and handle all of his boys for the boys passports before boarding a flight i went to that video and i collected a few comments for you to perceive does airport dad need an airport mom i'm an airport mom looking for an airport dad crying emoji is airport dad looking for a wife the greenest flag he should add this to his dating profiles what's his at the shorties love a competent dude bro these red pill dudes trying to teach you that all women care about is buddy the red pill dudes are fucking stupid bro i'm telling you well money isn't just money Money is a sign. Money is something that has psychology, has other things attached to it. Generosity in a relationship is very important, right? It's not just giving money, but it's also giving your energy, giving your time to the other person. So a lot of a classic uh, 
uh, turnoff that men will do is that they're not so generous with money, time, attention, etc. Mm. And it's a sign of something closed inside of them. It's not the money. It's the sign that someone isn't generous in their spirit, in their heart. Isn't it strange that with the passage of time, things look different? Anyway, the final thing that I want to say about sexual market value is that sexual market value is a bastardization of a term that you can already find within evolutionary psychology, and that term is known as mate value. And so, mate value would be all of the things that make somebody more or less attractive relative to other members of the population on aggregate. So usually when people mate, there's they, they assort or pair up on overall mate value. So the, the eights tend to pair up with the eights, the sixes with the sixes. You can think of mate value as a more holistic review, let's say, of what could constitute as somebody being attractive, so to speak. And so when it comes to the red pill, as we've gone over, for men at least, the only things that they really take into consideration are things like looks, money, and status. Whereas, as I said, mate value is more holistic. So it would take into account things like the thing that is considered to be the most important thing to a prospective partner, as I went over in the previous video, kindness, which I cited uh, Andrew Huberman for, who was himself citing David Buss. Man's an intellectual and that. Forget fucking s sexual market value. Are you pleasant to be around my guy. Where is, say, kindness in the sexual market value assessment? It's not. However, you could find it in mate value because again, mate value is a more holistic review. The red pill, the manosphere, would have you believe that it's men's looks money status that gets matched to women's looks and that's essentially how people coordinate. Hot woman, high status, high earning guy together, nothing in between, that's the correlation. And that equation of sexual market value isn't remotely close to what actually happens because what actually happens when people pair up is that they do it through a process known as assortative mating. So from a meta-analysis called trait correlations in human couples from nature, human behavior, People tend to form partnerships with others who are similar to themselves. A new meta-analysis examines correlations between human mating partners and finds correlations across nearly every trait studied. Education, social attitudes, and substance use showed the highest correlations. Whether you call it assortative mating or you're on some woo-woo, the universe shit, and, you know, like attracts like, your best bet at attracting somebody that you're attracted to and they're attracted to you is to lean in to yourself. And the point is, in dating, you want to be polarizing. So if you're Brad Pitt or Natalie Portman, you just want to be yourself and not scare anybody. Just like play it very safe, let the goodies flood to you. But if you are not Natalie Portman or Brad Pitt, or you're not like conventionally the most attractive person, you got to kind of lean into some extreme version of yourself and then uh, some people will be totally turned off, but some people will be really into you. And that's kind of what's, that's all that matters. You just need some people to be really into you. Well, because you're not optimizing for total area under the curve, are you? You only yeah, need a no. couple of winners. I think the reason that the red pill, the manosphere, put so much emphasis on this theory called sexual market value is first of all, because they lack female theory of mind. They don't actually understand women as individuals. They understand women as they relate to the caricature of women that they've created in their head. Moreover though, I think the reason why there's so much emphasis on sexual market value in the red pill is because it's a very simple, easily repeatable rubric to explain to men how to become what they need to attain. And yet it's something that so many, most people will not and cannot achieve. Dear viewer, if there is one single theme running Throughout this entire video, it's that you are being lied to. The idea of sexual market value is a parasitic mind virus at worst and a shortcut to short-term mating opportunities at best. Even if this equation were true, looks, money, status, you get them maxed out or as close to, would you even want to be with the kinds of people that require that to interact with in the first place? Oh sorry, there's so many precursors to talk to me, if you can just get this stat up and this stat up and this stat up. It's like those people are going to be the most fucking superficial in the world, bro. Sexual market value is not the magic key that it's presented as being. It is a key that unlocks doors that are predetermined to be valid 
rapid and shallow. For the love of God. Please stop letting these people monetize your anger and resentment whilst feeding you poison in return. These people are not supplying you with the tools to escape the matrix, they're just sucking you into theirs. If it isn't clear by now, I do not think that these people are bastions of wisdom. I think that they're Pied Pipers drawing you into water and letting you drown. <laughs> so, I hope that this video served as an oxygen tank, so to speak, whilst you're down in the murky abyss. If you would like another one, I encourage you, dear viewer, to subscribe, because there's going to be plenty more where that came from, and there were plenty more back that way if you haven't seen those and would like to watch them on the end screen. Let me know on your thoughts on this video down below, and if there's anything else that I've forgotten or want to add as a kind of bonus, you can find that in the pinned comment below. As always, Shout out to the motherfucking patrons holding it down for the mandem and that. If you want to become a patron and see your name on screen like these beautiful people, you can do so and support more videos like these. Drop a like if you haven't already, hit the bell if you haven't already, and other than that, thank you as always for hanging out with me. I had fun hanging out with you. Parasocial relationship game. 100. Date に来る